I'm Dr. DiPaolo. I see a few familiar faces in the audience. Um, this talk today was intended to be about minimally invasive shoulder surgery. Um, I'm going to um, give my talk, but then I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions because what I've found in the past is that everyone has their own question in mind. And I think those have been the most productive part of these sessions because regardless of how I tell you something, um, you're thinking about your own problem in a certain way. And usually people come to these talks to get information for their own particular problem or a relative's problem. And I'd like to be able to address that as much as possible. Remember, I can speak in generalities. You know, it, it's difficult to know everyone's particular case. So um, if it's something more specific, then we can either talk later or you know, follow up with me in the office. But I do want to take everyone's questions, and I'll leave as much time as possible um, to do so, um, to either clarify what I've mentioned or to, uh, more importantly, answer what you have in mind about your own particular problem. So I'm going to talk today about uh, minimum invasive. I, I have no financial disclosures of any sort. Um, so how many people here have heard of minimally invasive surgery in general? OK, good. So just about everybody. I'm going to do a little bit of a multiple choice here. So raise your hand if you've heard about it from a relative, friend, or family. So a couple. Uh, what about from another doctor? A few. What about from advertising? A few more. Um, more so, interestingly enough, more so from advertising than, than other doctors or family even. Is there any place else that anyone's heard about minimally invasive surgery that I didn't mention? So wh where did you hear about it? Articles in the paper. OK. So those are more informational. They probably have a combination of um, industry and uh, some professional resources. But interestingly enough, if, if you looked at the show of hands, there were at least as many people who heard about it through advertising as through other sources, and, and, um, you know, including family or other professionals. So it, it speaks a little bit to how this trend is being driven. Um, and I think there are some good things about minimally invasive surgery. And there's some things that aren't mentioned. There's some limitations. And the natural inclination for most patients, for most people, is to think that if it's, quote, less invasive, it must be better. You know, the implication is that it's less trauma. It must be less painful. And what I'm going to show you or talk to you about in this talk is that it's not always the case. And there's some nuances that you may want to know about. I'm going to speak about it in terms of shoulder surgery in particular because that's my niche. That's what I do. I also do other orthopedics, but I specialize in shoulder and elbow surgery, which runs the spectrum from open shoulder cases and reconstructive surgery, which is fracture care and, and joint replacements, all the way to arthroscopic surgery, smaller type surgeries. And I do that for both the shoulder and the elbow. So the full spectrum of types of cases. So the goals of this talk um, are first off to define what minimally invasive surgery is, because I don't think it's as intuitive as you might believe. There's actually pretty specific definitions, at least in my mind, and I want to make sure we're on the same page with that. And with that, describing what it is not, so not everything is minimally invasive surgery. <clears throat> also describe some of the benefits, which I think people come primed for the benefits. You know, you, you intuitively understand those better because, you know, that's, that's the promise. Um, but more importantly, I think it's important for me to describe the limitations because I doubt that many people have written articles or hyped up the limitations of minimally invasive surgery for good reason. And I'm going to tell you specifically when I do and don't do these surgeries. So I have specific instances when I do it. I do do minimally invasive surgery, um, but I use it in specific cases and not for everything. And I think that's key. So first, a definition. Um, in any communication, we have to be sure that we're speaking the same language. So I'm going to define for you what I consider minimally invasive surgery. And Hopefully, we'll be on the same page so that we can then move forward. And you may have a, a different definition or different understanding. 
So loosely speaking, with all types of surgery that I do, um, shoulder and elbow surgery, you can break down the surgeries into two main types. And I would break them down into open surgeries or arthroscopic surgery. So I've, I've put up a few diagrams. And the diagrams basically are cartoon-like pictures. And if you look at the left diagram, what that is is a diagram of a typical open approach that I use on the shoulder that's a very utilitarian type approach. And it's an approach to the front of the shoulder. And it allows you to get into the shoulder and do a whole host of different operations. Um, the picture on the right is showing you what we call arthroscopy. So arthroscopy has gained huge momentum over the last 30 years. And it's basically a combination of two words. Um, arthro means joint, and scope basically means, uh, scope is like microscope or telescope. So it's a camera. With arthroscopy, the surgeon is using one hand holding a fiber optic camera that is about as narrow as a pen or a pencil. And he's using his other hand for instruments. And arthroscopy is done through multiple small incisions. So you can actually access various parts of the shoulder or elbow joint or other joints for that matter with multiple different holes we call portals. And depending on where you put those holes, will put you into different positions in the joint. In orthopedics, we literally have, you can literally put a scope into just about any joint in the body. So there are hand surgeons using it on the wrist. There are surgeons using it on the elbow and the shoulder. There are surgeons using it on the knee and the hip. And they're some of the more common surgeries we do. But it's different than open surgery. But I need to make that distinction because I think there's a misconception and that is that um, some people are using the term minimally invasive to describe open surgeries, and some people are using it to describe the arthroscopic surgery, and they're two very different things. So let's get back to the open incision surgery. So the next picture basically shows you what two scars might look like, the left being an open surgery, the right being the arthroscopy like we showed you in the previous picture. Now most people would think that the the scars on the right would be more desirable than the ones on the left, but that's not always the case. You have to remember why you're doing the particular surgery. There is a school of thought, so to speak, that, that speaks about minimally invasive surgeries, and it's more common in joint replacements, so knee replacements and hip replacements, in which you still have to use open techniques. So I don't know anybody doing a knee replacement or a hip replacement with an arthroscopy or an arthroscope. But a lot of the popularity of the less invasive techniques, the minimally invasive techniques, are with uh, gain traction with joint replacements. So the thought process was that we'll take a standard incision length. You may look at one like that, but think about it on the knee or the hip. And then we'll shorten it up by two to five centimeters. And we're going to do all the same work that we had to do before, but now we're going to do it through a smaller incision. And the theory being there'll be less tissue trauma, less scarring, faster recovery, all these things. And interestingly enough, millions and millions of dollars have been put into developing instrumentation and even implants. It used to be there were jigs for cutting uh, forms on uh, when you're doing a joint replacement that were very large. And you've noticed over the years that they've shrunk and shrunk and shrunk because people have moved towards doing these minimally invasive techniques. But what you have to remember is there's always a, the, the main limitation is the size of the component. So no matter what, if the end of your femur or your shoulder, for instance, is this big, well, you've got to get that component through a space that's at least that big. Um, and what people forgot about was that if you shrink your incision, then sometimes you have to stretch a lot harder on that tissue to get into the joint, which can actually cause tissue damage. And I've seen this before. Um, and from my personal perspective, this incision, the one on the left, actually looks very good. The tissue edges look very relaxed. They came together very nicely. And I think you'd probably argue that if you had an incision like that that healed really thin, it wouldn't matter if you added a couple extra centimeters to it, um, as opposed to having a shorter 
but wider incision. Because what you'll see sometimes is that the incisions will spread. You'll either get a keloid formation or sometimes puckering because there's actually some tissue trauma going on. So I want to distinguish that type of minimally invasive surgery, the open type of minimally invasive surgery, and say off the bat that that's something I don't do. I don't quibble about a few inches or a few centimeters here or there when the main important things are with the open surgeries that I do are getting, often getting components fixed exactly in the position I want them to or getting plates or screws or things like that fixed exactly how I want them to because in the long run those are the things that matter for the operation and more than anything else than a few inches. One of my mentors um, was my former chairman uh, in residency and um, he was not a big fan of some of the open minimally invasive techniques and he, he used to make the point of saying when if you extend the incision as much as you need it that the tissues relaxed and the surgeons relaxed and he made a really good point that what, what happens is the tissues tend to fall away and you don't have to spread and you don't have to pull and you don't have to do these things and there's actually a lot, some literature to support that now. So I think it's interesting, and I don't know that a lot of people are talking about that quite so much. And I think the fat has died down a little bit with the joint replacements. People are recognizing it's not as big a deal. You still have to do the same job, and a, and a few centimeters may not make that much difference. Arthroscopy is a different animal, though, and I'm going to get back to that in a little bit um, because it really does do different things than the open surgeries, and that's why we use it, and I'll talk about that more. I want to skip ahead, I'm sorry. I wanted to go to, because I just touched on this, but this is just touching on some misconceptions of the open surgery. <clears throat> so misconception number one is that there's less pain. Um, studies have not really shown much of a difference with the open surgeries using slightly smaller incisions, that there's a big difference with pain. In fact, we are doing a better job of pain control nowadays in orthopedics, but it's for different reasons. And it's not really our doing. Um, it's more to do with the anesthesia and the pain protocols after. So I shouldn't say it's not all our doing because we, we do have a say in um, working with our anesthesia partners and developing post-operative pain protocols. But a lot of the advances in the last 10 years or so have been in pain management after these types of surgeries. So people in the audience here have probably heard of friends or family members getting joint replacements and leaving the hospital in two days, rarely sometimes one day, um, but a few days. That operation years ago was an operation that people stayed in the hospital for, for a week at a time or more. And we owe that a lot to what we call regional anesthesia. Um, regional anesthesia is basically when we use pain blocks so the anesthesiologist will put a numbing medication around the nerves that are supplying whatever body part that you're operating on. So the, uh, the woman who I operated on earlier today, I did a shoulder replacement, and she had a pain block put in by the anesthesiologist, and the pain block went in around her neck, and the medications went around the nerves that supply her entire arm. So her arm is numb for the next 10 or 12 hours, and that has a couple benefits. Number one, you wake up and you're not in pain. Number two, it allows the anesthesiologist to use less pain medication um, when, or excuse me, less anesthetic when they're in the operating room putting you to sleep, which is really a good thing because everything we do has a side effect. And one of the main side effects of the anesthetics is that they can depress your breathing. Um, so it allows the, the patient to be more comfortable and if, if you're someone who has medical issues, like a heart condition or breathing condition, then it's safer. Um, the other thing we've made tremendous strides in are the pain medications after surgery. So there's been a lot of study done on various cocktails, so to speak. And what we mean by a, a cocktail is basically a group of medications, not just one, not just the, the morphine derivatives like a lot of people are used to, like the Percocets and Vicodins and things like that. We like to keep those to a minimum as much as possible because they have a, a lot of side effects. Um, and if we can use a number of medications but in smaller doses, then 
we know that people will be more comfortable and able to get up and do the physical therapy and ultimately get home quicker, which you know, we've found in our experience that, that getting people more in their natural environment or at least to a rehab where they're getting active faster really does a lot more for your recovery than a few inches or centimeters on an incision. So I think we've, we've made a lot of strides, but very little of it has to do with a few centimeters or inches on, on an incision in, in, a, in an open surgery. Um, nicer scars, it's debatable. Um, the reasons are what I, I said before, and that is that smaller spaces often mean heavier retraction. So people here have probably seen pictures of surgery, but basically we use metal retractors to move tissues out of the way in order to get to the other tissues that we need to operate on. So for instance, the case I just did was a shoulder replacement. And there's a large muscle called the deltoid, which was on that first picture there. And I use a retractor to keep it protected when I'm exposing the socket because it's otherwise in the way. Now, if I use a really tight incision, then I have to use a lot of force to move that out of the way. And you can imagine that even though I can't see that, pressure on the muscle causes tissue damage. And we know it from having done uh, cadaver studies. So it, it's a proven fact. So in fact, having more relaxed incisions um, often helps. And I've seen them. I, I've seen ones where I've intentionally made a longer incision. And my experience has been that they end up thinner. And I think I'd, I'd rather have a thinner scar than a wider scar, um, personal opinion. Uh, less tissue damage we, we uh, talked about. And faster recovery, I don't know that there's much good evidence to say that uh, you know, uh, shortening the length of your incision is going to increase your recovery time. In fact, your recovery time is usually dictated by the type of operation that was done. So let's take the shoulder replacement that, that I just did. The, the type of replacement that I did, I restrict people in moving their shoulder for the first six weeks. So regardless of how big an incision I made, I'm going to put you in a sling for about six weeks and give you limitations on your range of motion that are dictated by a whole host of other factors besides the incision length. They're going to be di dictated by your quality of tissue, uh, by the type of replacement I put in, all types of things. And that has more to do with how I want that to heal than any type of incision length. So for me, there's far more other factors that factor into the recovery period than adding on a little bit of incision. So oh, I want to head back a little bit. Okay. So, this is where I want to talk about arthroscopy because to me, in what I do at least, arthroscopy is my definition of minimally invasive surgery. And I do a lot of arthroscopy and it's because it's a good tool around the shoulder and elbow. Um, it has some unique advantages and it offers an extension of what people were able to do years ago with all open approaches. So. I put this picture up, this is my favorite analogy of what arthroscopy is like um, to help people understand what we're actually doing. I think people loosely understand that you're using a camera and that they're small incisions, but they have questions about what it means. So simply stated, when you're using arthroscopy, your goal is still to accomplish similar outcomes that you would be doing with an open surgery. Um, but with different tools. So let's use an example. Your shoulder could be tight. Um, and if it's tight, it may have to do with a buildup of scar tissue. Now I can do that operation with an open approach, and I would use certain tools, certain instruments. But we now have the technology and the skill and the teaching that follows to do that same exact surgery with arthroscopic techniques. I just need different tools to do it. So to get you to understand, it's a bit like building a ship in a bottle. You can build a model ship, and you could use uh, set instruments, but you need special ones to do it when you're building the ship in the bottle. You can imagine that you, know, you, you still need graspers to, to pick up the sails or the little pieces of wood and put them together, um, but they obviously need to be shaped differently. And I have a picture here of some of the instruments that we use. What, what you'll notice about them is that some of them look like graspers, some of them look like scissors, some of them look like things you won't recognize. But they're basically longer handled, smaller versions of similar type instruments that we would use in open cases. 
So again, we can do, uh, you can fix a tight shoulder. You can tighten up a loose shoulder. You can fix rotator cuff tissue. Um, you can um, remove small loose bodies. You can shave away bone. You can do all these things now, and it's because a number of surgeons who came before me developed a lot of very good instruments, and we're continuing to develop them. In fact, I think arthroscopy, if you had to look at orthopedics as a specialty, arthroscopy is probably one of the top five innovations in the last 30 to 40 years in orthopedics, um, precisely because it's allowed us to do a lot of the same things, but in truly less invasive ways. So there's an old rule that I heard uh, when, when people try and sell you something, that you're supposed to talk about the benefits first and then talk about the limitations. But I don't like to do that. <laughs> I like to talk about the limitations because I think the benefits you probably understand or you're probably already primed for that. So again, we talked about the limitations for open surgeries. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the limitations for arthroscopic surgery. Arthroscopic surgery, I showed you the portals. You saw the incisions. Obviously, those incisions are smaller, much smaller than, than some of the bigger incisions we use. But not all incisions are that big. Um, I'll give you an example. If I do a rotator cuff surgery and I'm repairing the tendons of your shoulder, I can actually do an open rotator cuff surgery with an incision that's about that big, or sometimes even smaller, sometimes even smaller than that. And it's ironic, if you think about it, that Occasionally, I have to use a lot of those very small portals. So the picture you saw had two portals. But I've certainly done arthroscopic cases where I've used four or even five. So if you could imagine that each portal is maybe a centimeter in width, and you add that up, the length of that might be five centimeters. So you put that all together, the, the total might equal what I would use, or even more, if I was to do the surgery open. Is there less pain? Well, there are some studies that show that arthroscopy is, on average, less painful, but only in the early post-operative period. So when you stretch it out further past a few weeks, they tend to equalize. One of the things that, that people um, fail to mention often about arthroscopy is you, you focus on the small incision. But when I'm doing a shoulder scope or an elbow scope, in order to keep that joint open, we put fluid in your joint. And that fluid, depending on what type of surgery you're having, can sometimes leak into the other tissue. So it can leak into the muscle around the tissues. That fluid, in effect, is swelling. And swelling will be painful. So when your pain block wears off, you will have pain. It's not that it's a completely painless surgery. Um, now, granted, pain is one of those things that it's almost impossible to predict who is going to have pain and who isn't going to have pain. And to be honest, I've had patients who are almost pain-free after a few days of having shoulder scope and other people who take weeks and weeks. But it's difficult to tell because everybody's pain tolerance is different and the operations are different. You know, I may be doing an operation on one person that's 45 minutes and I may be doing it on someone else because it's a totally different operation for two hours. So uh, um, you have to remember that, that your surgery may not be the same as, as hers. Nicer scars, usually, I think that's dealer's choice. That's kind of in the eye of the beholder. Um, less tissue damage. This is one, um, one major advantage, um, is that the scarring is decreased in arthroscopy. And I actually think that is a major benefit um, because it allows us to use different types of rehabilitation protocols. So it used to be that people would always move the patients right after you had a surgery. And the thought was, well, you're going to scar if you don't move. Um, and it certainly is true with open surgeries. And I, do, I am pretty aggressive with the, the open surgeries and getting people to move. Not everyone, but, but a lot of people. But with arthroscopy, at least with some types of things like rotator cuff repairs and other things, it's not always necessary to get people moving right away because there is less scar tissue formation. The faster recovery, I think, again, this speaks back to what I was talking about, that your limitations on your recovery often have more to do with the limitations I put on you based on the surgery I did, not based on your incision length. So did I repair certain tissues that I have to protect because your body takes a certain amount of time to heal those? Or did I do a surgery which was 
more of removal of some tissue and kind of cleaning it out and you can move right away. That really dictates your recovery more so than incision. So let's talk about benefits. Um, less scarring, I mentioned that one already. Um, this has been particularly helpful for my patients who have rotator cuff tears. In fact, in the, the years I've been practicing, the five years I've been practicing now, um, I've changed my protocols of how, I've, how I treat the rotator cuff repair patients that I do arthroscopically. So in the beginning, I used to move people right away. And it's not wrong. There are still people who do that. But I've switched to now giving people a period of rest in the first four to six weeks, depending on how big the rotator cuff repair is. Um, because it's actually not necessary. You don't have to move people quickly. Um, because if you get a little bit of stiffness, people tend to work that out over time. Um, some good studies have come out just in this past year that have proven that, that the two are equivalent in the long run. And my general philosophy is to keep things as simple as possible. Um, the reason being that when you introduce more variables, like a therapy protocol that someone might be either confused about, or maybe they'll have difficulty getting there because of transportation, but when you introduce more variables, you introduce more complexity and potential for problems. And it's worked out well for me, so I've been happy with that. Um, visualization. I think this is a very unique benefit. So we're now able to get to very small areas uh, without doing big major approaches that you couldn't get to before. I mean, I'll give you an example in my practice. Um, one of the surgeries that I come across relatively frequently is a labral repair. So the labrum, I don't know if there's a good, good view of it here. I'll show you, I will outline where the labrum usually lives. This diagram doesn't show it, but this is the socket of the shoulder. We call it the glenoid. And the labrum is a ring of tough connective tissue that deepens the socket right around here. It looks sort of like a washer. So it, it's a common structure that I operate on, usually in younger patients, for various reasons, either shoulder dislocations or some people just injure a certain part of their labrum. And there's areas in that labrum that are difficult to get to without big approaches if you didn't have a scope. So one of the areas is the back of the shoulder. The scope's been wonderful for allowing surgeons now to get to the back of the shoulder with just a few very small incisions and fix that labrum with the instruments that we showed you earlier um, without making big open approaches, without having to spread a lot of muscle. Because one of the things about the shoulder is that there are multiple muscle layers and things can get deeper and deeper and your life as a surgeon can get more and more difficult getting into those small spaces without these instruments. So that's been a huge benefit. Another um, area where visualization is extraordinarily helpful is um, uh, in the, what we call the pouch of the shoulder, so at the bottom of the shoulder. And that's allowed us sometimes to just go in very easily, pick out loose bodies, and the elbow it works very well too, but pick out small loose bodies sometimes if, if patients have had that type of injury. And that's been very helpful. Um, but you can see quite a bit. You can get in deeper angles and um, have a very well-lit view with the arthroscope. Because it has a fiber optic light on it, um, places that you couldn't do with open surgery even. Um, because it can be very difficult to visualize uh, deeper structures without the, the, the arthroscope. So I think that's a major advantage. The last major advantage is one that not a lot of people, I'm assuming not a lot of people have, have, uh, are talking to you about, but it's one that's big for us and ultimately is big for you. And that is um, deltoid detachment. You're saying, well, what the heck are you talking about? It's, it's a little technical, but um, it, it matters. Your deltoid is your, your large shoulder muscle. So everyone can see their, their shoulder muscle there when they look at it in the mirror. And in years past, rotator cuff repair techniques, which is one of the most common operations out there, relied on detaching at least some of the fibers of that deltoid muscle from your shoulder blade. And the reason you had to was to get access underneath the shoulder to the rotator cuff. The problem with that is that once you detach it, you have to reattach it. 
And again, you're adding in an extra variable into the equation. You're hoping, relying on your body, your patient's body, to heal that deltoid now along with the rotator cuff. The arthroscope eliminates that. You do not need to detach any of that deltoid muscle in order to get in and do the repair. And the problem with the deltoid reattachment is this. 99% of the time it works. But that small percentage of the time when it doesn't work, it's a major problem. So when it, if it actually doesn't heal back to the bone, it's very, very difficult to go back in and re-repair it because the forces from that muscle are enormous and they want to pull away from the bone. So removing the possibility of that infrequent but very high impact complication is a big plus in my book and it's a big benefit that, that you, um, you reap if you have it done that way. Now that's not to say that you should do all rotator cuff repairs um, with arthroscopy because they don't all fall into that category and, and I'll talk about that right now. So <clears throat> up here is a list of uh, types of surgeries that I do and it's probably not a completely extensive list but it's, it's a list when arthroscopy may work for you. The caveat to all of it is that you have to have someone who actually knows what they're doing with the scope in order to get one done, uh, in order to have an operation like this. And I would put to you that I would rather have my shoulder operated on with open incisions if that's the way the surgeon knows how to do it better if they were trained that way and they're expert in that way, than having it done poorly with a scope. Because ultimately, the thing that matters most is did you do what you set out to do? Did you repair your rotator cuff wear? Did you repair the labrum well? <clears throat> did you loosen up the shoulder? Did you tighten up the shoulder? Did you do what you needed to have done in order to make you better? Ultimately, that matters more than anything. And um, a great example was a, a mentor of mine <laughs> named John Fenlon, who um, taught me open shoulder surgery. And he was almost 70 when I, when I finished residency. And he was still practicing. And, and he's a pretty famous uh, shoulder surgeon. He developed some implants. And he had picked up arthroscopy uh, somewhat. But he still did the vast majority of his uh, rotator cuff repairs open. And he had it down to a science. And he knew what he was doing, um, and he could do that operation extraordinarily well. And, and that's an example of, I would rather go to a guy like that than someone who was dabbling or doing it once in a while, but said, yeah, we, we can do this you know, through a scope, and you know, I, think I, can, I think I can do it better. The surgeon has to know their limitations. So um, you know, again, these are, these are surgeries I, I do arthroscopically. They, um, I don't universally do every single one of these arthroscopically. Labrum tears I almost always do arthroscopically. Rotator cuff surgery I mostly do arthroscopically, but there are a few exceptions. Um, I did one a few weeks ago that was an open surgery, and it was a gentleman who had a rotator cuff repair about a year ago, and he had a re-tear. Somehow he re-tore. He came back to me. I took him back to the operating room, put the scope in the shoulder, looked at it, but felt that adding a, a patch to my repair was going to help him. So I still could do the repair. I actually did it partly arthroscopically, but then I made a small open incision to put the patch on. And for various technical reasons, I like to put the patches on if you're going to use them with an open incision. There's some people who argue that you can do it through the scope and um, it can be done, but I think there's some scientific reasons that reasons I do it that way. So there's exceptions. There's other types of rotator cuff repairs that I, that, that I may go to an open approach as well. So it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, I'd say somewhere in the 90% range I'm doing completely with the scope. Maybe more, maybe more, but um, I, I haven't looked at the exact numbers. Um, some other things, AC arthritis. So where your collarbone meets your shoulder blade. It's one of the more common areas for people to get arthritis. And it's actually a relatively simple fix of an operation. You essentially shave down. Um, a, a pinky's worth the width of a pencil, perhaps, of bone, and the bones don't abut. And you can do that with arthroscopy with small incisions. So that's a very good one, I think, because that was one that people used to do open, smaller incisions, and that's helpful. Um, instability surgery, 
release of a stiff, stiff shoulder, release of scar tissue, biceps tendonitis. These are all things I do um, with the scope. And again, it's not to say you can't do them without it. I've just, in my practice, uh, found that it's helpful and I think beneficial. So there's unique benefits to arthroscopic surgery. Hopefully I've outlined some of those for you and if I haven't done enough, please feel free to ask me questions about it. It's a good tool, it's not for every condition. The, the, the key to it all is the skill that the surgeon has with using the tool. It's a tool that takes a lot of training to learn how to use. Um, many years and, and uh, learning under people who are very skilled and continued learning because you can continue to expand what you learn with it. Um, and experience matters. So hopefully you found this helpful and I'm going to open it up to questions because um, I found that to be very productive uh, with these types of talks. So please feel free to open it up and I will stay as long as people want to answer your questions. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The question was, do you have diagnostic tools prior to surgery that have a good probability of knowing what you have going on prior to getting there? Um, the first one that's very low tech but extraordinarily accurate in the right person's hands is a good history and a physical exam. So we tend to put a lot of stock in technology. MRIs, CAT scans, all these things. And I, I'll give you an example. Today I saw a patient in the morning that had an MRI. It was a young patient. He was about 20 years old. The problem is the MRI that he got from his primary care doctor was not the right MRI. So the MRI that he should have had, should have the physician should have ordered one in which some dye was placed into the shoulder. Because if you know the test and you know what you're looking for, you know that the test that was ordered did not have a very good sensitivity of picking up the most common problem in a young patient. So in this patient, he was 20 years old, the most common problem with a trauma and his symptoms um, would be a labrum tear. The problem is the MRI that he got was not very sensitive to pick that up. So what I actually had to do was backtrack and I wound up ordering him a new MRI after I had examined him. So it's important to not just order tests because you don't know what's going on. You really want to have an idea of what's going on first. There's a technical term in statistics, they call it pretest probability. Um, they, we emphasize it a lot in what we do. And it's more important to know the proportion of certain types of pathologies in, the, in a population. So I know that labor injuries are relatively common in younger, younger patients. So then I have to backtrack and know what the right way of looking for that is. Um, so I put a lot of stock first in your story, in your history. It's true that you get a majority of the information you need based on you just sitting down and telling me, based on your age, how you injured yourself, did it happen in suddenly, did it happen over a long period of time, um, and where your symptoms are. That tells me a lot of information, you know, uh, that um, a test a test like an MRI may not. And then, to, in, for me at least, the more technically advanced things like MRIs and CAT scans are usually more for planning purposes. There's certainly times where it helps distinguish diagnoses because you can't always tell everything. There's a lot of overlap. But, but certainly I think it has more of a role for planning because the problem with all those advanced imaging techniques, uh, especially MRI, which has such a high level of detail, is that there's noise in those pictures. In other words, people think that well, because I can see everything, you must know exactly what's going on. The problem is that a normal shoulder in someone who's 65 may look exactly the same as someone who has a problem. The only difference may be the actual symptoms. So if someone comes in and just orders MRIs right away on people without understanding the context of the problem, saying, well, no, I just had pain for two days and it just started suddenly. Well, maybe your problem is has nothing to do with what the MRI might pick up. Uh, another good example, stiff shoulder. So adhesive capsulitis is a diagnosis that I see all the time. It's another longer way of saying frozen shoulder. 
Um, essentially, it's a stiff shoulder. It's a very common diagnosis of people who are diabetic, have thyroid conditions, um, women in middle age in their 50s. And people's story is such that they woke up one day and they started having pain. They have difficulty now reaching into cabinets. It's just hurting and hurting, and nothing they do seems to make it better. I've had a lot of people come to my office already with MRIs. The problem is, an MRI is not going to show you anything with that. Really what you need is about a 30-second physical exam to move someone's shoulder around. So having a doctor who knows what they're doing put their hands on you, move you around, you can figure that out very easily. You're stiff compared to the, your, your normal movement. So that's one where you don't need anything sophisticated. And, and we can put too much stock in it. So I hope I'm not you know, going off on a soapbox here, but I think it's important to, to remember that there's limitations with the tools such as MRIs and things. Now I use them. I mean, the, the woman I operated on earlier today, I, I had ordered a, a CT scan, but that for me was to look at the architecture of her bone because I knew what her diagnosis was based already on simpler tests like x-rays or physical exam, and then I knew that I needed to um, have an orientation in my mind of what the architecture of bone was to put in her shoulder replacement well. So that was the rationale. So it might be different than what you might be thinking. So, Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sometimes I do. It really depends on the context of your problem. And so, um, in fact, I had a gentleman yesterday afternoon who, oh, I'm sorry, repeat. <laughs> Um, the question was, do you ever advise against surgery if you have someone who has a rotator cuff tear? So the example is, I had a gentleman yesterday who came into my office who said that he tore his rotator cuff 10 years ago. So he knew he had a tear. He tore it, it was some kind of fall that he had. But he told me flat out that he would, it would bother him a few weeks out of the year, usually in the wintertime. He would usually do physical therapy. He had a regimen of exercises that he would do. It would ultimately make it more comfortable for him to a point where he was happy. He could do most of his activities that he wanted to do. And he had never had a surgery. Now, he was coming to me because another doctor referred him. And this time, he had been having pain for about six weeks. And this was unusual for him. It wasn't getting better. And his motion was more limited than normal. So why did that happen for him at this time? I don't exactly know. I'm not sure why he wasn't able to cope this time. Now, maybe his tear got bigger. That can happen. Um, so there's a couple cases where you might not want surgery. One, your overall health is poor, and you just can't tolerate an operation. So there's some people who are just so unhealthy, their heart is so bad or their lungs are so bad that you can't tolerate surgery. So that's one. Uh, two, maybe you've had surgery before and it's failed and you're just, you don't want another surgery. You don't want to go through it. That can be a personal preference. Um, three, maybe you've had surgery and you had so much scarring or the tissue just wasn't repairable. We don't always, we're not always able to repair every rotator cuff tendon. Um, we'd like to be able to, but sometimes the tissue quality is not the best. Um, the other reason may be that you're just not painful. I mean, you, you may have some weakness. Um, but you've managed and you can do what you want to do. You have different goals than, you know, someone who's pitching for the Reds. And you can get by and you're not that painful. You notice a little bit of difficulty lifting your arm in certain situations, but you can get by and you don't want the risk. It's all about context. And it's every single person wants something a little bit different out of uh, how they use their arm. And if you don't respect that, if you don't talk that through and just treat a finding, not um, the person, you're doing someone a disservice. So certainly there are times. Now, are there times you fix them? Yes. I mean, there's, there's multiple times, and we could talk more about that if, if you want. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, like sure. I'll, um, let me see if I can go back to a picture. I don't know if I have a picture of... Oh, So um, I'll try and draw it for you. You do a shoulder replacement for a few reasons. The, the main, most common reason is arthritis. And what arthritis is is when you've worn away the cartilage on your joint. Cartilage is basically a smooth, bearing surface of your joint. It's a tissue that's a few millimeters thick. 
And normally it's as smooth as ice on ice. It's a really smooth surface. Some people are lucky enough that it lasts them their whole lifetime. Other people, though, it wears down and it exposes the bone underneath. And it can be like sandpaper on sandpaper. It can be very gritty. Um, so what a replacement is, is if you, if you see this white tissue here, that's cartilage. And you see it here, that's cartilage. That's because this sphere is articulating with this surface. Now when that wears away and becomes extraordinarily rough, like the, the woman I, I operate on this afternoon, then you're grinding. You're, you're very painful and you're grinding. And the only way to alleviate that ultimately is with a replacement. Now you're not taking out the entire shoulder. Really what you're doing is just removing this surface and this surface here, very thin layer of it. It's, it's not as, as big as you'd think. And replacing that with a new metal ball and a new plastic socket. So it's less bone than ultimately you'd think. Even with a knee and hip replacement, it's less removal of bone than you'd think. It's usually a few um, millimeters thick of, of bone that you're removing. And then you replace it with the, the new components that either are cemented into the bone or sometimes there's surfaces that grow into the implant from the bone. So the, the recovery, oh, the question is, it sounds like a long recovery period. Um, it depends on a couple factors. Number one, your overall health. Um, number two, what type of replacement you're getting. Um, and number three, how bad you were to start with. So in my practice, most shoulder replacements get a period of limitation on the range of motion, usually about six weeks or so. And that depends on what type we're doing. Um, usually in that period, you're wearing a sling. But then you progress to a new period. The next six weeks, approximately, you're working with a therapist to move the shoulder in more of an active motion, so powering it on your own accord. So my hope is that by the end of three months or so, you are moving your shoulder with perfect mechanics after that. And then from three months onward, it's a strengthening phase. So while the entire recovery is long, you're actually making significant gains in the first few months of surgery. And it's not an operation you do on a person unless they're very, very painful. So you don't go replacing someone's shoulder unless they're coming to you. I have a saying, I don't tell you when to get a shoulder, sur shoulder replacement, you tell me. Because the pain has to be bad enough and the impact on your quality of life has to be bad enough that you're just not functioning well, that you can't sleep and you can't do what you want to do. So ultimately, the recovery period is worth it for you. So, Other questions? Yes, sir. The question is, with a torn rotator cuff, over time, if you put it off, will it get worse? And what is your recovery period after you do get it repaired? So there's two in, in, when you treat rotator cuffs, there's a lot of ways to categorize them. But one of the main ways is acute versus chronic. So an acute rotator cuff would be someone who, one day their shoulder's perfect, the next day they're walking, slip on the ice, fall right on their shoulder, and they feel a tearing, feel instant pain, difficulty lifting their arm. That, you can tell just by their story, that's an acute rotator cuff tear. The chronic tear is different. Chronic tear is, eh, I've had shoulder pain in my shoulder on and off for the past five years. I don't remember doing anything, but just wear and tear. You know, I, I like to do a lot of different activities. You examine them and then maybe do some testing like an MRI and you find a rotator cuff tear. That's a different animal altogether. I can tell you some things we know for certain about rotator cuff tears. Number one, the acute tears we know tend to do better if you get to them faster with surgery. So we know there's a window of opportunity after which it does ultimately become difficult to repair certain tears. There's other factors involved. Sometimes it has to do with the size of the tear. So if the size is really big and it's a new tear, that can lead the tear to go on to scar quicker and be more difficult to repair later. The other thing we know for certain is that over time, all full thickness rotator cuff tears tend to get larger. And as they get larger, on average, they tend to develop more symptoms. They tend to get painful. So if you're someone who 
You went in, you had some shoulder pain, never had a trauma. You saw your doctor, you got an MRI, and they saw a small rotator cuff tear. They said, well, what do I do? How do I treat this? It's not as simple as saying, yes, you have to go to surgery. Because I could take a person like you and do an injection, send you to physical therapy, and you get your shoulder stronger, and maybe you function totally fine in whatever it is you're doing, your line of work, whatever it is you're doing, but you still have that tear there. In other words, you have a defect, but you're living with it, and you're comfortable. It's hard to make an argument to get a surgery for someone like that because you're not painful. So what do you do at that point? Well, you can keep an eye on it. You can watch it and understand that if you are all of a sudden getting painful or you know, the normal exercise that you do, like this gentleman that I saw yesterday, that aren't working anymore, maybe it's gotten bigger. You know, and maybe you should consider something. So the rotator cuff tears are some of the more complicated things to explain to people because you'd think it would be easy to say, you have a tear, you should fix the tear. And it's not that easy at all. That they come in all shapes and sizes. They come in uh, you know, different quality of your tendons. Where the tendon is torn dictates, often dictates how I treat it. The quality of the tissue is different person to person. Um, you know, whether you've had scarring in there, there's all different factors that really relate to it. And you have to dissect that out for each individual patient. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So her question is, she had a repair. Um, she said, is there anything she shouldn't do so she doesn't tear again? Um, you know, there's a number of factors that predict whether you're going to re-tear. One of which is the size of the tear in your tendon at the time you had surgery. So in general, the bigger the tendon tear, the more likely it is to re-tear. And you may not have control over that. That may just happen based on um, how big your tear was and how good the repair was. Number two is the quality of your tissue. That's something none of us would know unless we actually saw the tissue in the operating room. If the tissue quality was good, you've got a good chance of it not re-tearing. I usually advise people once they've gotten past that four to six month window of rehabilitation and they're 100% strength to do what they want to do, to do their normal activities. Certainly we're all at risk just by living, of getting injured. You know, and the goal of any operation is not for you to pot yourself in the ground, it's to live, it's to move, it's to do the things that you want to do. Um, are there things that can put you at more risk? Sure. Um, but your body is very smart and will often tell you what you can and can't do. So you don't want to push beyond your own strength levels. I mean, if you weren't a weightlifter before surgery, then you, you know, I don't know that you're going to work into being a weightlifter after. But you have to remember, if you are a weightlifter, that you don't want to push it too fast to get back to where you were before. So it's a hard question to answer without knowing all the specific nuances of your own case. Um, but those are some factors we know for certain. I mean, sure, you know, it's like saying, if I fall again, can I tear it? Certainly, you know. Um, a gentleman, I, I fixed his rotator cuff, uh, oh, two years ago or so. He... Um, he was about two months after his surgery, about six weeks after his surgery, I think he was still wearing a sling. And, and he loved to golf. And so he couldn't golf, but instead of golfing, he went and walked on the golf course just to walk the course. You know? So here he's in a sling. Now, the grass was wet, and guess what? He slipped, fell right on his shoulder, and he retore the repair. Now, could that have happened without the repair? Sure. You know? So it's hard to say. Is it more likely in that early period after surgery? Yes, because you're not strong and can't catch yourself. There's, a, there's a, a certain amount of weakening that goes on after you do surgery because you're putting someone, it's like if you laid in bed for a couple weeks, your leg muscles would get weak. You know, if you're not using the shoulder normally to lift uh, you know, plates and put them in, in cabinets and things like that, you're gonna have normal weakness. So, you know, uh, nice fluid motion is always gonna be better than jarring motion, obviously. No problem. Other questions? 
uh, when? Uh, any benefit to wearing a sling was the question. Um, so she's asking, is there a benefit to wearing a sling prior to surgery? What type of surgery? Okay. I don't advocate wearing a sling prior to surgery. Some people do because it's, uh, or I don't know if they advocate, but some patients like wearing one because it's the only thing that can bring them comfort. Um, I don't necessarily advocate it uh, because it's very hard to immobilize your shoulder joint completely. It's not necessarily going to give you any extra benefit. If a rotator cuff is torn and your surgeon has to repair it back to the bone, it doesn't automatically reattach itself because the muscle forces are pulling that tendon away from the bone and keeping that there. The sling doesn't help it reattach or, or in essence heal anything. But if it's comfortable for you, more comfortable in that way, I have nothing against it, certainly. There are reasons I tell people not to wear slings though. There are people who sometimes have fractures and don't move their shoulder fast enough or don't move their elbow fast enough. And if you stay in the sling too long, you can get stiff. So that's a time where I tell people, okay, lay off. But that's usually after the incident, not before a surgery. So. Other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about diabetes. Yes. Is there any, any value in protocols of the diabetes medicine in nutrition and the different move for maybe inflammation, cartilage could be last longer or even the risk of you know, a lot of problems with TB and the radio and so on of this kind of thing? Right. Can you evaluate to that? So the question is um, specifically with arthritis. Glucosamine, right. So the, the question is, with arthritis in particular, so remember arthritis is when you've worn away the cartilage, you're bone on bone, bone on bone in your joints, knees, hips, shoulders, you name it, just about any joint can get arthritis. Is there a benefit to alternative therapies? So glucosamine, you name it, there's a host of them out there. Um, and the answer is yes and no. So the, the best way we know to study things, you know, our goal is to be as scientific as possible is to do what we call randomized control trials. And what those are is when you essentially take a few hundred people who have the same diagnosis, let's say it's shoulder arthritis, and say we take 100 of them and we give them a placebo pill, which would be a sugar pill, and another 100 of them, and we would give them whatever supplement it is that they're advertising. And then we measure, are they getting better? And we do that with objective measures, objective as we can, range of motion, pain scores, all these things. and then. We run that trial for a period of time, and then we look at all the numbers and we decide, on average, are people getting better? I can tell you that the NIH did a study, a big study, with glucosamine and chondroitin in knee arthritis. And they actually did find a benefit in certain people. It tended to be people who had more moderate and severe arthritis. The catch with the whole thing is that the nutraceuticals and supplements are not extraordinarily well regulated, so you have to be careful with finding out if you're, you have the, the, um, uh, the amount of the, the ingredient that they're saying is in there because sometimes they can be, uh, they can be um, filled up with fillers. And there are some independent labs out there, and I don't know them off the top of my head, that, that do testing on the active ingredients. So that's number one. Number two, I know that there is some data on fish oil. Um, and, and people advocate omega-3 fatty acids for a lot of things. The reason for that is it's a natural anti-inflammatory. So what you're taking aspirin or uh, ibuprofen for, uh, fish oil has a certain anti-inflammatory effect that is helpful for your heart, your brain, um, and arthritis. And so I advocate that for people who want a more natural supplement. I take it myself. It's one of the only ones um, I take, partly because I don't get enough fish in my diet, but um, I don't love fish that much. Um, but it's, it's good for you. Um, your question about can you save the cartilage longer or regenerate it, we don't have a magic pill that regenerates cartilage yet. Maybe we will someday. We don't have one that regenerates it. Um, but the fact is that people sometimes can live without cartilage for a long period of time. I've seen people with what looks like bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, um, but if you can keep their symptoms under control with the anti-inflammatories, um, you know, in this case maybe a fish oil or pharmaceutical grade, then they can live comfortably. And the decision about when to get to, to do a surgery is dictated more on their symptoms popping up again or it sort of escaping the, that symptom control. So you don't treat just the x-ray, you, you treat the person. But no, we don't have a supplement per se that rebuilds cartilage. If, if 
you hear that there is one out there, I, I would run away. I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it. You're just wasting your money. So, so his question is, he, he said that he had a labrum repair at one point, um, but then has had some limitation with range of motion, still has pain, and he saw someone else who told him that he might have bone on bone. I'm assuming he said you had arthritis. Um, it's hard for me to answer the question without knowing your exact circumstance. Let's assume you have the ball and socket type arthritis. If that's the case, um, you're probably not going to do more damage just by throwing the ball, but you might hurt. Um, I had a patient who I recently did a shoulder replacement on who was a, a carpenter, painter, worked overhead all the time, doing this all the time. And he knew it was going to hurt, but he had to do it for his job, but he also didn't want to get a shoulder replacement for a while. He'd been putting off for a long, long time. He just didn't want to be out of work, didn't, just wasn't the right time for him. So he knew that he could do it, it would hurt him, but ultimately it was just causing him pain, not necessarily doing more damage, because if you indeed have worn away your cartilage, then there's enough damage already done. Um, now there's other problems that are different, and it's hard to know exactly, you know, without actually knowing your case, and I'd have to see your films and see you examine you to say, oh yeah, that's actually your problem. You may have a different problem. I don't know, I mean, sometimes people have stiffness after a surgery and never completely work it out, but it, it's not because it's arthritis, it's just because it's stiffness. That's a potential complication from a labrum surgery, but I don't know that that's what you have unless I examine you specifically. Yes. Okay. Right. So it sounds like you had arthritis to start with. That you went in and they said there was they're repairing the labrum, but you already had arthritis. So your overriding problem was the arthritis. The problem is, and that's that's the issue is, you know, it gets back to not treating films or MRIs or treating people. There are diagnoses that trump other diagnoses. So you can come to me, and certainly an MRI might say, well, you have arthritis, you have a labrum tear, you have some partial rotator cuff tearing. Well, guess what? The one diagnosis that trumps the rest is the arthritis in the shoulder. And so you have to tailor everything towards that because everything else is secondary. Labrum tears can be part and parcel of arthritis. It's like in the knee. You might have a meniscus tear, but if it's in the context of arthritis, forget the meniscus. Your arthritis is the problem. But unless you have someone sit there and talk to you about that, you're not going to know it. Because it's so technical and there's so much jargon that I could easily tell you, um, I could easily focus you in on any one of those particular problems. But if it's not the one overarching problem, you may not be getting the long-term solution that you need. Um, sometimes it's not easy to know that, though, because if you have mild arthritis and someone goes in your shoulder with a scope, you, you don't always see that on an MRI. It's not that easy to pick up unless it's a little more advanced. And again, I don't know your circumstance, but I've had people where um, I operated on a woman last year who she was complaining of pain, thought it was her biceps that was bothering her, um, thought she might have a partial thickness rotator cuff. They're very active, 70 years old, but still exercises, lifts weights, I mean, in great shape. Um, went in on her shoulder and her x-rays looked pretty good. I mean, they didn't look really that bad, like she had much arthritis. But in her joint, she had patches that looked like moon craters of no cartilage. And that was her problem. That was her overarching problem. Wasn't that easy to see on an MRI. Usually when it's severe, you can pick it up on just an x-ray. Um, hers, you know, she had a little bit of, of thinning of the cartilage, but it wasn't, it wasn't evenly spaced enough to see. So that's an example. I don't know your particular case, but um, it was a wide spectrum. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, it's certainly possible that sometimes you can't see it before you get in there. You know, you hope that you can, um, but not every case. And it's that in-between case that sometimes is impossible. So, yes, sir. Um, yeah, the question is, is there any way to delay arthritis? I don't know if there's an answer to that. There's different types of arthritis. There's, there's some that can be delayed or treated, but it's a small subset. And that's a type that we call inflammatory arthritis. So there's people with what we call psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. 
that there are now uh, medications that we call disease modifying agents that actually do slow the process. Where if in years past when we didn't have them, people's joints would get destroyed very quickly. Now people are lasting years and years and years without ever getting joint replacements. So certain subtypes, there's other types that we don't know how to delay. Some people get it, and by the time they see you, by the time they even know about it, a gentleman I just saw in the office the other day, he's had pain in his shoulder for 20 years, but you know for whatever reason he didn't get it examined. He was living fine, but at, by the time he saw me, the, the joint was destroyed. It was just it was arthritic. So could we have stopped it? I don't know. There are some people who their genetics are just predisposing them to arthritis. There are some other surgeries in the hip and the knee that people are working on. They think that if we do certain things, we might be able to delay it, but it's not proven yet. So that's sort of the next level of evolution in what we're doing is to try and we know some things that cause arthritis. We don't know everything, but can we now say with certain injuries, can we put in something at the time that may help delay it or prevent it altogether. It's, it's, a, it's the future, but it, it's going to take years and years to know for certain because the, the problem with all of medical research is it relies on time. You, you, um, you can't say, oh, I have the cure for XYZ that develops over long periods of time. In other words, I can't put in a joint replacement on someone and say, oh, this, we know this is the next best one. This is going to last longer than all the other ones that are put in when it's only been in existence for two years. Because we have studies that go 20 years. So unless you can beat the 20-year study, then how can you go promising to someone, well, this one's going to be better than the ones they used to use, unless it's radically better, then you know, there's speculation to it. So you have to take things with a grain of salt. There's still a lot of things that we're stuck with. More questions? Have we? Build everybody's brains full. Of, one more question. Oh, here we go. Okay, and I can stay as long as you need. I'm I'm happy to. So, sorry. Yes, I had um, a resident and a medical. Oh, this question was: Did you instruct or show someone your the particular surgery? So, the hospital where I was working today, um, we have residents. I'm part of a residency program. Not every operation I do involves the residents. It just depends on where. In my particular case, where I'm operating. There are some places I work where I don't have residents. Um, but the orthopedic residents are basically is a, the, the training you go through to be an orthopedic surgeon is four years of medical school, five years of orthopedic surgery training, which is essentially an apprenticeship um, under multiple other surgeons. And then I did an extra year of fellowship in strictly shoulder and elbow surgery, working with other mentors. Um, we have a residency program at Wright State where we have four residents per year. So this particular case, I had a resident and a medical student. So, and depending on their level of knowledge, you know, it dictates their participation in the case. The resident I had today was an intern, so he was helping to hold things, and I was doing everything. So, yes, exactly. So, yes, sir. His question was, say you've had an acute rotator cuff tear, you went through surgery, went through rehab. Um, assuming the tissue quality was good, the repair was good, and your rehab was appropriate, which I put it four to six months, um, you will continue getting better for the better part of a year. So I tell people that they're not going to be 100%. Now, granted, your gains, usually you get the first 80% or so of, of your gains in the first six months. And then you'll, you'll taper off. You'll keep getting better, but slowly. Um, usually, if it's a full tear and you went to the operating room with a real issue, with a real full thickness tear. Now, there's differences. Sometimes it's a partial tear. Um, but if you went with a full tear and you had real legitimate problems, pain with sleeping, pain with lifting your arm overhead, weakness, and the repair was good and the tissue was good and everything went well, most people are better than they were before it started. If you are right back where you were, you might be suspicious that there's a re-tear. And I've had patients who re-tear. It's, it's um, uncommon, thankfully, but um, the, the gentleman I spoke about earlier where I put a patch on, he was a, he was a guy who re-tore 
this tendon. And sometimes you re-tear it in a little different spot. Sometimes you re-tear it with another trauma. So if I have people who aren't satisfied or say you get to about six months, they say, yeah, I don't know, it feels like it's similar or I feel it popping and it was doing well for a while, I wouldn't hesitate to get an MRI on them to check if they've retorn the repair because it's not impossible. It can happen. You're, you're depending on a lot of factors to um, go right with that surgery, and it, it does happen sometimes. So you, you mentioned the full tears. Is partial tears different? Partial tears are different, and they come in different sizes as well. So a partial tear, my analogy that I use is a full tear would be if I had a hole in my pants, you could see my leg, that's a full tear. The partial tear would be maybe I'm a little threadbare. You know, I'm missing, uh, it's still covering, you can't see the skin, but you know when it's the, the, your, your fabric's usually this thick and now it's this thick, you know, you can start to feel the wind blow through the pants. That's a partial tear. Now, the crux comes in, how big is the tear? If it's really thin and you only got a couple threads holding on, you treat those more like a full tear and you actually just remove those couple threads and you repair it, period. If it's a small partial tear, so maybe it's just a couple threads that are just frayed and kind of causing inflammation, Sometimes you can just shave that and smooth it down. Ultimately, that might help you because partial tears can lead to inflammation in the shoulder. Inflammation is pain. So if you can decrease the inflammation, you decrease the pain. And sometimes it's just a matter of, it, think of it also like the end of your pants. If your pants are too long and they're dragging on the floor and you get some frayed edges or like the end of a rope, sometimes that's how it looks. And all it is is a matter of just getting a clean edge, smoothing out those rough edges, and it stops the irritation and then you rehab it. Those are much easier to rehab for people. People can go back to doing what they want to do a lot quicker. I, I will get people out of slings really quickly. I had a, a young guy who was a baseball player here was told he had a full tear. He was only in his early 20s, and that was where my antenna went up, and I knew there was something up. That was one where I didn't believe the MRI as much as I believe my own clinical instincts. You talked um, before, um, someone had asked about, uh, I think you had asked about different tests that you use. Um, to know ahead of time. Now this guy came in with a test with an MRI that the radiologist said he had a full thickness tear. I said, you know, I've been doing this a little while and I do a lot of these. i would never seen a 23 year old who didn't have some trauma that had a rotator cuff tear. Sure enough, when I went in his shoulder, he had a small partial tear and we smoothed it out and he's, you know, out of his sling in two weeks and rehabbing it and he wants to go pitch and he's going to try out for, I think he's going to try out with the Reds and all that. Um, but it's variable. So your partial tear might be different than yours, and they can be treated different ways. You can delay it in some people, and other people just you know, have a hard time. And everybody's different. You can't predict based on the size of, of the tear. So yes, ma'am. If you had, uh, she's asking if a screw, a screw may have been put in. You remind us you had a rotator cuff repair. Yeah. Um, we tend to call them anchors. Sometimes they look like screws, like little mini corkscrews. They're small. They're a few millimeters in length and width. Um, and um, they have sutures that come out the ends, like through an eyelet. You, you can sometimes screw them or tap them into the bone, and they hold into the bone. And then the sutures are coming out, and you put them through the tendon. It allows you to tie the tendon back to the bone. So. Yeah, very common. Yeah. In fact, they were invented to accommodate doing rotator cuff repairs arthroscopically. Sometimes we'll even use them in an open situation when they're convenient. So the other way of doing it is to make a little tunnel in the bone and pass sutures through the bone and then tie it back. If you look at the picture um, up here, you'll, you'll see that when you have a tear of the tendon, the tissue is pulled away from the bone here. So what you have to do is get it back to the bone. The tissue literally pulls away so you have to have some kind of anchor point, whether it's an artificial anchor point or a hole, a, t a tunnel in the bone where you're putting the sutures. The goal is to essentially bring that tissue back to the bone so then lets the body heal. Not enough just to put the suture in. Then your body has to heal it. So. The screw holds, the, the screw is just an anchor, an anchor point for suture. The suture then lays it down. So the screw only, acts as an anchor point for sutures. Yeah. Other questions? Did everybody get their fill? Thank you for being patient. <laughs>